Coming up on Customer Tech Talks, we hear how Microsoft Azure is driving trusted data sharing and collaboration in the medical industry. Stay tuned. In today's connected world, one of the most valuable assets to any business is their data. And this has never been truer than when that data is used for medical research. I'm joined today by Rodrigo Barnes, Chief Technology Officer, and Finlo Boyd, Lead Developer from Iridia, whose Azure-hosted health data science platform helps facilitate collaboration among biomedical researchers and clinicians around the world. Let's have a quick look at their video before we jump into the interview. Iridia provides cloud-based services to research hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, and international research collaborations. We run trusted data sharing networks for clinical research projects globally. Our customers want to make more data available to researchers or are themselves looking for suitable data sets to answer their research questions. This needs to be done securely with privacy and ethics by design. In European terms, Iridia is a data processor for our customers. Working with Microsoft has helped to scale our services and continue to deliver high levels of security and compliance for our customers. We've been able to work together with Microsoft to help organizations adopt cloud services as they go on a journey to share more data. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Great to be here, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Now, we got a brief glimpse into who Iridia is through the intro video, but Rodrigo, I'd like to start with you and see if you can maybe give us a little more insight into what it is that Iridia does. So we offer digital research environments to research hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, and international research collaborations. These build trusted data sharing networks. Assurance and compliance is really important to data owners, and we provide streamlined access and computing resource to researchers within that trusted boundary. The use cases for our platform cover a broad spectrum of clinical research, for example, research leading to the development of new diagnostic tools in our Alzheimer's disease, or for example, population health during the COVID pandemic. Two main products that we offer are within that are our collaborative workspaces and our fair data services and that, are, that allow data sharing, data access requests to be managed. Um, those are hosted on Azure, where and users can find and request access to data on approval, they can work on that data in a secure way using statistical machine learning tools in the cloud. And it's important to say that we're a data processor only. So we, we all process data on behalf of our customers. That's all we do. So this sounds almost like a, a SharePoint environment, but built specifically for medical research and collaboration. Now, as you mentioned, there are two key aspects of this environment, the, the data hosting and also the workspaces, both of which are hosted on Microsoft Azure. Can you maybe share with us some of the reasons and benefits for choosing Azure? Yeah, of course. Our, our challenge at the time was twofold. We needed to scale up across territories and markets across different countries. And at the same time, the standards for security were, were just rising. So expectations were rising around security. Over time, we'd found ourselves moving from on-premise deployments, hosting at hospitals, to hosting at specialized co-location facilities. And we found that our customers were gaining confidence in public cloud as an option. Um, this, this was good for us because we'd been working with these with specialized hosting providers in, in health and research sector, but found that there was too much variety in the APIs they offered us. They were inconsistent. The services were patchily available. There was limited automation, and that was costing us time and effort. Azure offered consistent APIs in the regions we wanted to work in and reached that higher degree of automation. At the same time, in many cases, Microsoft was already a trusted partner for our customers. Research hospitals and other healthcare organizations, they're at the start of a journey to public cloud. And it was really helpful to collaborate on building cloud as a platform. Um, Azure Compliance was a big part of that, helped us to achieve our ISO 27001 certification, for example. So not only were you looking to take advantage of the scalability and the standard APIs that were available within Microsoft Azure, you could also build on those compliance standards that existed as part of the service and use those to kickstart your own certification process to help build your solution. Now, Finlo, as the lead developer for Iridia, I suspect you probably also have some insights on some of the benefits of using Azure to host this environment. Can you maybe step us through some of those? 
Yeah. So from an implementation point of view, those uh, certifications are of increasing importance to our customers. And also some of our customers will do their own due diligence on uh, Azure services uh, for other projects. And so this means that when we're rolling, rolling our services out, then uh, we gain the benefit of work that our customers have already done. So we're not needing them to go through their own sort of due diligence for us directly. We're, we're using a trusted platform. Now, it's really great to hear how you could, you know, beyond those certifications, also use things like the regional availability of services to both help scale and also expand your business around the world. And really doing this with a standard inf interface so that it kind of helped you grow and, and continue to build that business. Now, as you look back, I'd love to hear about some of the challenges you faced when you were moving to the platform. And Rodrigo, I'd like to start for you and maybe you can take us through what some of those challenges were. We saw a, an initial challenge around acceptance of public cloud by our customers. There was a time when public cloud was just not a considered an acceptable option in the health sector. Um, for public cloud to become an option, they needed to be satisfied and reassured on several fronts. Compliance with privacy and data protection, how we built our services and what those built services were built on themselves. And the residency, which is where the data is going to be stored, super, very important to hospitals. Sovereignty, which is ensuring that the data is under the correct national jurisdiction. And, and addressing those help to meet that concern around public cloud. And to a large extent, the engagement and advocacy of Microsoft within the sector has helped customer adoption. Subsequently, we were able to build on the accreditations of Azure provides, and we still, however, we still had to do the detailed work of ensuring Azure resources were configured correctly. Um, we didn't do as much of the hard work in convincing the customer that Azure could be used to store the data because of that engagement that had already happened. That's some really great insight there. And, and something I think a lot of people working within heavily regulated industries like the medical industry experience when they start talking about the cloud as a place to store data. And especially when we think about things like data re residency and data sovereignty and the impacts that that can have on their business. Now, Finlow, you had some insights too around the regionality of data and, and specifically how you dealt with that within the product. Can you maybe share some of those challenges? Yeah. So. For the majority of the uh, the implementation there, it, it does become fairly straightforward using Azure. You select the correct region for the services, sort of and that customer. Care does need to be taken because um, not all services are region specific, but it's all documented. So um, there's documentation available uh, enabling data residency and data protection in Microsoft Azure regions. Now that just contains all of the information that we need to sort of select or select the services that we want to use and sort of implement it all. It also gives us the information we need when engaging new customers in terms of what the options are available for, for regions. We also had the work of sort of moving our system to Azure. So and there were quite a lot of choices to be made there. So whether we did a lift and shift of our existing implementation or more in-depth redesign to try and make uh, more advantage of Azure features. So we did take the opportunity to do that more in-depth redesign. And so we try and take advantage of Azure features sort of wherever we can. Probably the biggest challenge around that has been a multitude of choice, which is a nice, uh, nice problem to have. For our particular implementation, um, we'd already moved towards containerizing sort of our application. And so we had sort of choices of service for what we could do for hosting those containerized services. So we chose uh, Azure Kubernetes services, but we did also look seriously at the Azure container instances. That's worked out uh, sort of well for us, I think. Really great to hear how you could move beyond those challenges. And, and interesting to hear that one of those was actually, you know, the idea of the amount of choice you had and which way to go and which direction to take to actually build your, your solution. Um, and also awesome to hear that you landed on, you know, containerizing those apps and using Azure Kubernetes services to host that. Now, as you maybe are looking back on your experience with Azure, what are some of the lessons you would share with someone else who's maybe looking to build their own globally available platform, either in a, a heavily regulated industry or, or one that's maybe you know, a little more freeform with its data? What are some lessons you would share? I think the, the biggest lesson I would share is 
um, just how how great experimentation is. And there really are several features of Azure that that do make that quite easy. Um, so sort of around the free trials, sort of the hourly billing, it really doesn't cost very much to try something out. Something that goes along with that is automation. Because as your service becomes more complex, then you really need to automate to allow further experimentation to get to the point where you can explore new things. There are maybe dangers around that if you uh, roll out too quickly. Uh, certainly things around networking will be harder to change. And so it's always good to pay attention to how things will scale. So we've got uh, kind of an extreme example of the benefits of that. So uh, when sort of the UK went into lockdown, there was such a big move to um, sort of cloud usage. So the capacity within um, the region where our uh, development, sort of it was running out of capacity for our machines. We were able though to, because we had the, all the automation in place, um, we were able just to spin it up in a new region. And so that that was really um, just highlights the benefits of, you know, being able to automate um, your, your infrastructure and your code there. There was sort of really big benefit there. Some really great insights there and really great to hear how you could take advantage of that infrastructure that's available to you to be able to experiment early and get all the information you need to move forward to production. And then obviously, you know, moving into a place of automation where you can really take advantage of those services in the event that something happens that you didn't have planned, like that uh, instance you mentioned where you ran into capacity issues within your dev environment, but were able to use the automation processes to move that to another region without impacting any of your production services. Now, Rodrigo, I'd like to hear some of the insights and lessons that you have for people, and, and maybe you can share some of those with us now. Yeah, I guess as we've been growing our customers and using Azure more, I, I've, I've been learning some new meanings of scalability. I, I suppose I'd always thought of it as organic growth, you know, responding to demand with the ability to spin up new capacity, but and, and, and public cloud providers like Azure offer great ways to do that. But fundamentally, I'd always thought of that as, as a steady growth. So in our business, geography matters, um, where the data stored matters. So being able to grow organically across territory helped. And it's super exciting to see that we're now deployed across the world from the West Coast of the US to Western Australia. And, and with the right automation, we were able to move quickly into new territory when demand arose. And once we were in the cloud and our use cases developed, we actually found ourselves supporting new types of scalability. So what I'd call a sustained burst demand. So not just because you were busy on a day or you had a lot of not an event, but actually over a long period of three months or so, you maybe had to, to support three to five times the normal capacity. For example, when we were running a data challenges for our customers, which had broad participation. That was a great, you know, the, the ability to, to see that kind of scale um, and experience that was good. That's really great to see that your view of that automation really allows the business to be able to expand into new regions and spin those up quickly um, and with a sense of velocity so that you can really start to grow the business. And then again, being able to handle that scaling as you put it in a consistent manner that's sustained over a period of time so that you can help deal with you know, unexpected things that happen in specific regions. Now, you also mentioned when we were speaking earlier, there's a, a different type of scaling you've been starting to experience with the platform. Do you want to maybe give us some details on that? That's right. Uh, the other type of scale we're seeing more is it has more of a fractal aspect. So federating cloud services and a mix of on-premise and third-party uh, cloud-hosted partners. Um, so I suppose it's, it's kind of hybrid cloud, but, but very diverse. So this is an exciting area of federated data sharing that our customers and our communities finding increasingly attractive in the healthcare space. We are developing that with our international research collaborations where you're bringing together a network of people, for example, in the Alzheimer's disease data initiative or the ICODA research network. In that scenario, we find ourselves in a cloud-based service provider being a backbone for the network, almost like an enterprise bus for data sharing transactions within the ecosystem. Rodrigo Finlo, thank you so much for taking time with us today. It's been great to hear about your experiences and all of the great work that Aridia is doing. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Now, if you want to learn about the services that Aridia offers, you can head over to their website to find out more. Of course, if you want to start building your own Microsoft Azure solution, you can check out Microsoft Learn for all of the free training resources to get started. 
Microsoft Learn has modules covering everything from the fundamentals of Azure all the way through to developing augmented reality experiences with HoloLens. It has certification guidance and even live interactive shows on Learn TV. If you have your own story you'd like featured on an upcoming episode of Customer Tech Talks, you can reach out to us at cttalk at microsoft.com to get started. And of course, be sure to follow us on social media so that you can keep up to date with all the latest episodes. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you on the next Customer Tech Talks.